everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and that's right the big day is finally here for big pig let's get into it uh, the strict technomancer that is vincey v let us get to the technique and learn it vincey v gw was kind enough to send me this copy of the new what's he actually called tusk boss on Mogrunta, but i think we all know he's just called big pig and i'm really excited about this model uh, today, I'm going to take you through painting it. We're going to focus specifically on three key areas. The armor, the orc skin, and the fur. Uh, these three elements make up the vast majority of this model, though Big Pig is not a misnomer. This thing is huge and has a lot of stuff going on. But I'm going to take you through those core elements, how I painted them to match with the rest of my existing Iron Jaws army and basically how we make this thing really pop and be super This fig's cool. a lot of fun. As you know, my existing Iron Jaws army, I'll show some pictures of that up here, uh, is something I'm very, very proud of and something I put a lot of time uh, and work into. Uh, so I want to make sure that Big Pig fits in with that force, which presents a challenge. We're going to have to go back, resuscitate some paints I haven't used in a while, remember how the heck I did this scheme like four or five years ago, and uh, so it's going to be a journey along the way of rediscovery. But I hope you find this video useful. Let's head over to the paint desk and see what we can do. All right, so we've got the model just Zenithal Prime. seems like an easy way. There's a, this is a model with a lot of detail, a lot of texture, a lot of little things. So we're going to start with just a nice, simple, very light dry brush with some ivory. But, you know, any off-white color will work. Really, I'm just wanting to pick the, the all the details out. It's going to help for some of the thinner paint layers, but it's also just going to make the model more readable because this guy is just jam-packed with stuff. And so seeing all of it is legitimately sometimes tough. Um, I want to set down just a basic blue tone on the armor to get working, and the easiest way to do that is generally the airbrush. So here I'm just using my um, Infinity, and I'm working with some Army Paint or Speed Paint. Uh, to, to lay down this blue. Now, this is not the original blue that I used, and, you know, this is where I want to make a slight point of fact. I think people get really wrapped up in, like, recipes and stuff on, you know, their armies, and the reality is you don't have to make it match exactly in the span of a whole army. You know, I painted most of this army five years ago, and I don't really remember what colors I used. Um, I, I went back and looked at my old videos, actually, and I was like, man, I don't feel like using those exact same colors. I'll, I'll, I'll get to something close. Once it's all painted and everything's done, you're not going to really notice any difference. Uh, you can use some of the same and vary it up, and that's all right. It's fine. But it takes me a couple of quick coats of this, um, you know, just two very thin layers to get it up to a point of, of where I'm happy with the blue. Uh, next up, we're just, you know, sort of starting to sketch out some highlights. This is just really using the airbrush to, to jam in some of these highlights quickly and really heed some of these shapes. Uh, all of the Iron Jaws armor have these really nice panel plates and planes that just sort of move in different directions. And so you can really use the airbrush or, or even a dry brush, as you'll see me do a little later, to, to bring out all of that interesting texture and the direction and, and, and things like that and create sort of interesting planes of light um, across the surface. But of course we can't create light without a bit of a shadow. So here in, of course, we're getting our old favorite Payne's Gray uh, and just working in some of those deeper shadows. And specifically I'm trying often to oppose the lighter parts that I just did with deeper shadows. Now when you're adding so much shade and tint like this, um, you are knocking out all of the saturation. So some of our later steps will be to bring that back in. A lot of this is, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on the armor, is because this is such a big major part of it. By the way, if you're wondering why his one shoulder pad is attached and the other three like plates aren't, it's because you can't not have that piece attached. It's actually part of the leg. The other three plates are all separate, but that piece is the leg. That's how you actually attach the leg, so you can't leave it off. Now again, we're going to do some easy edge highlighting, uh, which is called get a dry brush, a very soft makeup brush, wipe basically all of the paint off, and then just very, very, very lightly go over it. And you will catch just the edges. It's a wonderful trick. I may do a video on that or, or include that in a video in the future. But yeah, just a light dry brush is a good, simple, easy highlight trick. Now, I mentioned the lack of saturation. Once we apply all those highlights and all those shadows, we're going to we kill out all the saturation. So I'm coming back in with some Vallejo blue ink. This is basically a single pigment color. It's highly saturated blue. 
And so as a result, we're going to, you know, instantiate in a lot of that saturation back in, make it actually feel blue again, which is important. This is supposed to, to, to feel like blue armor. And so building in the saturation into the midtones, not covering all of our highlights, not covering all of our shadows, just using a very, very thin filter of this to build that back in. Whenever I work like this, I'm usually thinning like six to eight to one, something like that, just to really get it, uh, just to really get the tone back there. But we're not done yet. The back and forth work continues. Oh, tuck in, folks. There's so much of this. Um, now I'm going to take that same thing and I'm going to start creating little micro volumes of light on there. So I, the airbrush gave me the broader planes of light across, say, the entire back of the armor here where I'm working. But I wanted to have the smaller plates also have some variation in their light as well, making sure I get the individual little um, raised lines and that those stand out having some light gathering in some of the lower areas, those kinds of things. And so that is a little too precise really for the brush to do or for an airbrush to do all that kind of work. So here we're going to go in with the brush. Now we come in with our uh, Amarth blue. This was the original color that I decided to keep from the original scheme because I really, really like it. And this is what makes it really feel like the same armor. Oftentimes, if you've got one punchy color that feels the same, it'll feel the same even if your other tone is the same. You use different shadows, you use different highlight tones. If your punchy mid-tone is the same tone, it'll feel like it's the same thing. So I'm just doing a couple thin applications of that all over the miniature, helping to sort of blend together the uh, original layers of where I put on those highlights and then into the, the other tones. So I'm using this here as a glaze to just bring it all together. In much the same way, then it's time to sort of by brush, get those nice deep shadows in there. This is once again, very thin Payne's gray ink, um, you know, down to a filter. And I'm just finding those little itty bitty spots that could use some more deep and rich shadows and, uh, and putting those in there. Oftentimes you'll I'll, I'll go back and like feather it out with an even thinner filter after this, so just a couple quick passes. Um, around the, the miniature to make sure that I've got that nice full run. But of course, once that's done, then we've got to go back to the mid-tone again. This time we are going to use the Amarth Blue again through the airbrush. Um, but what we're doing here is just applying it as a bit of a, um, a bit of a, again, a filter, just like I used it with a brush the first time to really pack that punch, to smooth the transition between the lights and the shadows and to uh, you know hide all, not all the brush strokes like I don't mind if some of this armor looks a little rough it's okay we don't want anything too obvious but the armor is meant to be somewhat textured we're going to put on a lot of battle damage later and stuff like that so if there's anything especially egregious we can always just hide it with later work one of the most fun parts of doing orcs and other creatures that don't take good care of their stuff is you don't have to worry about super smooth blends in the early parts because you can just go back later and scratch and damage the heck out of the armor um now to show a little more detailed here's the three armor plates that are left off i'm going to build up the final highlights in the corners you can see where i already worked now i'm going to take that mix of amarth blue and ivory and one more time i'm going to go back into this uh and then i'm going to take you know sort of make sure every highlights where i want then with the brush i'm going to take the final amarth blue and really just do multiple glazes of it to smooth and work that in. This starts with a little bit of wet blending actually because I'm working while the first layer of paint is still wet. Then I feather them into each other. Then I come back with just the glazes of the Amarth Blue and run that over the top. This is a very lengthy, complicated process. Don't feel like you should have to copy this in any way. You could cut a lot of these steps. I just hold this army to like a really high standard so I you know, spent a lot of time doing it, but you could do a lot less and still have it look good. Uh, of course, this armor is textured. As I said, orcs don't take care of their stuff, and even the sculptors know that, so they worked in all of these, you know, scratches and dings and dents. At the same time, we have things like these rivets and other cuts. So now, basically, we're black lining and, and, and uh, the model. So I'm using just a, a black paint here to um, fill all those cuts, to black line in between everything, painting all the rivets. Everything that's going to eventually be steel needs to be turned completely black. So that, that way there's a nice dark shadow around it when I lay steel over the top. Then I just use a little combination of that Amarth Blue and Ivory again to go through and hit my edge highlights to catch the, uh, to do the light catches on the bottom of the cuts, stuff like that. This is all still the early steps, just me working with what's on the sculpt itself. We're going to enrich and add to that sculpt 
with later steps. So just because this is what the sculptor has on offer doesn't mean it's where we have to stop. If it seems like I spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time on that armor, that's for a good reason. When you're painting your figures, you shouldn't be spending the same amount of time on every element, especially when those are armies or, you know, for, your, for the tabletop, not for display or competition. Instead, you want to really focus your efforts on the parts that people are going to notice, that are going to matter, that are going to really draw the eye. And in this case, and with most Iron Jaws, that's the armor. Uh, it's such a huge part of the figure, it's such a serious focal point. So between spending a lot of time on the armor and then the orc face itself, if those two elements are really well painted and really well defined, the rest of the figure could almost just be base coats and no one would notice. So that's why I'm working so hard on making this armor look cool and doing a lot of back and forth to really make it pop. And you'll see, we're not done yet, we've got some more coming at the end. Okay, we need a break from the armor. My goodness, that was like almost 10 minutes of just working on armor right there. And in real life, it was many, many hours. So instead, we're going to turn to the skin. And no, he's not a red orc, but he's going to be hes going to be a green skin, of course, like, like the name says. But I'm applying Berserker Bloodshade as a over the Zenithal first. One, to kill out any of the blue that might have oversprayed. But also, two, because the red will seep into those deep recesses and it will act as a beautiful undertone for the later steps. I also do it on the fur. And so what we're going to do here with the fur is this is a nice quick step. This is really reinvigorating after working on uh, the armor for so long. I want to take a nice yellow color and I'm dry brushing the fur, but not all over. Just, 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 just on the upward facing areas. Okay? So just where the plane of the piggy's skin, his fur, is facing up. Then I'm going to take this contrast. So, so we berserker blood shaded the entire fur and the orc skin. Then we yellow dry brush to the top. Now we're going to come in with this wonderful brown tone and we're going to cover all the fur. This is going to go over everything, top and bottom. Making fur look interesting and cool is so easy and it requires no, no, no skill or effort. You can just use dry brushing in more limited ways. One of the things I always see people do is they dry brush the whole model equally, top and bottom, and then wash the whole model equally, top and bottom. No, light still exists. And we can heed that. So here again, I go back and I dry brush just the upward facing stuff. So there was yellow in the top part, red and the original highlight down on the bottom, but it was quite weak from the zenithal, the initial zenithal and dry brushing. And now I'm just re-dry brushing after that, that wash, the very upward facing stuff. Now I take some of this red brown infused fire slayer flesh. It's a wonderful tone that's kind of part red, part brown. And now you're going to see one of my favorite tricks with contrast paint. So here I'm only doing the lower sections. Okay, we're not going to get up into that upper area. But instead of just uh, applying it only there and letting it stop, I apply it to a couple areas, then I rinse the brush, just dip it in water, wipe it, and then I feather out the edge of the contrast paint. Contrast paint stays wet for quite a decent amount of time, meaning that what you can do is you can now take that that we've applied. Okay, so we got it there. We rinse the brush, wipe it on a paper towel, and then I can just use that water to feather out the edge of that red and just feather it right up. It's amazing how smooth and heavily textured spaces you can make contrast paints. It's really fun, and it creates that wonderful variation because now the top of the fur has this wonderful yellow infusion, whereas as you move along to the belly, it's more red. Okay. Now let's turn to some orc skin. I begin with just a base coat of thalo green. That's just a set of base tone. It doesn't, very little of that's actually going to be there. It just turn the orc green is the step. Really, these three colors are going to be our, 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 the vast majority of our work. So I start with the thalo green plus a little bit of the sickly green. Or sorry, green sky. I apologize, green sky. And I'm just going to cover almost all of that original thalo green. I mean, we're working to cover like let's say less than 10% of that uh, original phthalo green is still going to be here, okay? And this is really our base tone, right? This this color right here. Uh, by the way, I hate all the orcs that have these big jaw 
things up in front of their face. It is the worst design element that makes them so hard to paint. But there was no way to leave it off him, unfortunately. Very annoying. Anyways, um, the uh, so now I'm just slowly infusing more and more of the sickly green as I build up the highlights. But I'm not going to go just sickly green. I want to start you or gosh darn it, I'm infusing more and more of that green sky. It looks sickly, doesn't it? Now, as I continue building my highlights, I'm then going to get up into and start including the sickly pink. There we are. And the reason I'm using the pink is for, for sort of three different reasons. Number one, it's a brighter value, and so it's a perfectly valid highlight color. Two, it's pink, and so has a little bit more life to it than the green. Human eyes recognize red and pink things as being alive. And three, when the pink tones, which is made from a red, mixes with the green tones that uh, are, are the orc itself, what you get is those are complementary colors and they come together into the yellow-brown spectrum in the middle. So you get a really, really naturalistic highlight, as you can see there. I really like how that came out and that looked. And that's through simply equally mixing those pinks and greens and letting that complementary color action work against each other. The final pick out was just with a little tiny mix of the um, of the sickly pink and the green sky. Yes, nailed it. Now it's time for glazes, of course. We've got to bring all those disparate layers together. Here I use a mix of the original thalo green plus some of the green sky. Uh, thin, 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 thin way down into a glaze. And we're going to just apply multiple, multiple coats of this on the lines in between to smooth everything down. I also, I never put it on the highest highlights, but I do kind of run some gentle ones over there. And then we glaze back in the opposite direction, again, taking that mix of just sickly pink and green sky, turning that into a thin glaze, and then coming back up the other direction. So we glaze down toward the shadows and then up toward the highlights. By going in both directions with the glazes, we end up with a much smoother sort of blend and gradient over our initial layers. Now, one of the things I often see people leave out of orc skin is the color pink, and I love it when this is included for the same reasons I just said before. When we put some pronounced pink on there, it's a complementary color. It looks really good. It makes the model pop. It makes the orc feel alive because we humans recognize pink and green as blood and vitae and life. And so hiding that pink in the ears and the creases of the forehead, on his little piggy nose, on his little lips, right, uh, in his cheeky cheeks, uh, all of these wonderful places will give us a much more alive orc. It'll feel like a face. This is my progression for fire colors, a bunch of dollar roundy inks. We start with a mix of white ink and ivory, then ochre yellow, orange fire, and red earth. And this is for our freehand. So, of course, the armor is going to need freehand. All of the armor in my uh, Iron Jaws Force has these flames painted on it, as you might have seen in the earlier images. And these are really simple to draw. We just do some, some swoopy swoops, um, just very little, little swoops. And you can always keep building them up and out and up and out. Like you start with one thin line, and then I build wider, and I build taller. I'm using a 50-50 mix of the ink and the paint because that'll give me the opacity to cover in basically like uh, one solid coat while still having the flow from the ink to make it easily uh, shapeable. It's, it's very easy to do these lines. Once that's on there and it's nice and dry, we can then start tinting that color. Here, we're just gonna work with thin versions of all the inks. We start with a thin yellow ochre. It will have a very pronounced effect on the white, but the nice part about it is if you overspill just a tad and get a little on the blue, when you're working with this very thin ink, it really won't do much of anything and you won't really notice. You don't have to fix anything. Um, these inks are really punchy and intense, but really they only cover over the white. Uh, next up, then we're going to start taking the orange and we're going to work in the opposite direction because we want to pull the orange toward the top of the flame. Um, we want the hottest part of the flame to be at the bottom, the base, where it's the warmest. Um, and so I start doing some very thin glazes of that orange, just tracing it up, up, up toward the tippy tip tops of the flame. Um, this takes about three applications of this over all the different flames on the miniature. And when you're working with inks that are this thin, they will be very glossy. Oh my goodness, they'll get so glossy. And that's fine. It's no big deal. You'll actually see the shine as I kind of rotate the orcs around in, in some of these things. Um, finally, moving up to the red earth and hitting just the tips and again, working very thin. I actually go back afterward and then do another glaze of the orange just to bring it in. And then I ultra matte varnish everything uh, at, the, at the very end. 
Now, let's do some added stuff. That's right, we're back to the armor. Now that the skin, the fur, all of that's done, it's time to, to add more to the armor. We had some scratches and chips already from the sculptor. We're going to add more. I grab some little pluck foam. This comes out of old clam packs and stuff like that. Dip it in a little Rhinox hide, wipe most of it off, and just begin dabbing, dabbing, and stabbing at the miniature. Not everywhere, not equally. This is the next place I see people go wrong. They hit every single section of it like they're trying to paint the model with the sponge. You want to focus your stabs to where the model would naturally have damage occur. So you notice that front corner of his shoulder pad, I really, really hit that over and over again because that's where I, what he would use to ram into people. You can see that the areas like the edges, the places they would get struck the most, that's where you focus and dab, dab, dab. And the more you dab, the more it'll build up. Then we're going to reinforce that. We're going to use that randomness that the sponge created, this wonderful organic randomness that makes it feel so natural. Uh, it, we're going to reinforce that with some brushwork here, taking some of those that you know ended up kind of big or, or in a nice place around the corners where the damage would naturally occur because the giant pig would run and slam into things and scratch itself. We're going to put some more action lines. We're not just going to draw a line. We're going to show uneven tears and scratches. That's just more Rhinox hides, the same thing. Once that's there, we're going to then reinforce some of the new scratches we made, as well as some of the original sponge weathering with some little light lines highlights underneath. I just pick random ones and give them the line underneath to show that there's a bit of torn paint or something like that that's catching the light. Not only does this create more light, dark, light alternations on the model, you don't want to do every dot. Don't try to find every dot your sponge left. That is not the goal. You're just doing a few of them, a few of them here and there. By having it be more random, it adds more depth and complexity to what the battle damage looks like. Then we need to reinforce sort of the rust in here. And for that, I use Vallejo Rust mixed with some of that Rhinox hide. And I just slowly move toward pure rust. And yet again, not every brown dot gets turned orange, only some. I pick some of them to be rusted, not all of them. I pick some of them to go very, very, very intense on, not all of them. It needs to be random. Nature is very, very random. And so in that same way, we have to be as well. I then take that same orange mix with a little bit of the brown, thin it way, way, way down just with water, and we're gonna do some streaks. You don't need special streaking products and everything like that. They work fine, we can use them. They're just good old fashioned thin acrylic paint and lots of strikes. The key is you wanna work extremely thin and you want to be doing, you see I'm striking it multiple times. Strike, 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 strike. That's what we're doing. Then I go to pure rhinoxide, same very thinness, and I work there as well. Um, this is meant to, to represent water spilling out of this repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly over time. So you want to have it, you want to you know, hit that with your brush 10 times, 15 times. Each one being very thin, that's to show the natural streaks. Not just out of the chips, but also we're going to do it out of the rivets because those would also gather water. We're going to also rust those rivets, and then we just have some of those streaks coming down. If you get one that's too strong when it's still wet, just give it a quick wipe with your finger. And look at that. You get a very natural looking thing because it looks like the middle hollowed out and dried first, which is exactly what would happen in real life. So we can just rust some rivets, rust some of our own pits, and with that, the armor is done, and that's our main three elements. There you go. Big Pig is all done and ready to just charge and crush the enemies of the Iron Jaws. I can't wait to get him on the table uh, and get some games in with him and probably do a couple more of these as well. Uh, but thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you liked this, if you like Big Pig, hey, give this a like. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating. We have new videos here every Saturday. If you've got any questions about anything I didn't cover, feel free to drop those down in the comments. I always answer every question asked. If you want to support the channel, you can do so below through the Patreon link uh, or through the merch store link. Uh, the Patreon is focused on review and feedback and taking your next step on your hobby journey. As always, though, I thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.